So my intention with this panel session was to identify another of, 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 a number of themes, primarily around transformation and things. So my purpose here is the... Uh, the coordinator of the discussion is just to facilitate it, but we would be um, remiss if we didn't respond to questions from you. So uh, I'll drop into my graduate teacher role and facilitate a dialogue with the rest of the class so that you can bombard these uh, people with, with um, questions. One thing that I would like to do, first of all, is to, is to link some of the things that have, have um, come up in all four presentations, and that's this notion of transformation, and it's directed at you, Rob, initially. So, something that you said in the Delta Lloyd story was about the, if you will, the softer parts of business transformation, in other words, the skill set that needs to be worked as you transform roles and responsibilities in the new world of IT for IT. Would you care to speak to that for me? Yes. Yeah, it, um, there, there are two challenges in the transformation from a people's perspective. One, of course, the, if you really design your organization around these value streams, there might be different uh, skills you need, like automation, automation of deployment, provisioning, testing, monitoring, meaning that what people typically do today, and automation that is, is close to the technology, yeah. which means that people do test automation, deployment automation, or any form of automation, they are typically IT specialists. So they typically say, oh, let me handle this, because I know best how you deploy windows, or how do you deploy firewalls, or whatever you need. And as a result, having an orchestration layer on top of it, or an end-to-end uh, flow is it more difficult and challenging. Mm. So what we try to do is create uh, skills that are not specific technology, but more like how do you create automation uh, on, on the sort of orchestration layer, meaning you don't want uh, Windows specialists only do Windows, you need the sort of people that know how to do provisioning in the cloud. Mm -hmm. And they need broad skills, suddenly. They need to understand how do you provision a virtual machine to, 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 to let's say, storage. So it's not just uh, separated teams that each deploy a component, but now you have somebody who says, if I want to provision something, I need, I need a working solution. I don't want a, a Windows server sitting in the cloud and nobody can access it. Yeah. So you need all the skills combined to make that end-to-end -end workflow. And it sounds so easy, right? But it's, it's very complex, so you need to have a central team that manages that with new skills. Yeah. And the reason for my interest is obviously as, as, as an academic, there's a, a curriculum issue here. One of the things that we're actively working on at the moment is to stand up the people certification for IT for IT, and we'll report further progress on that when we meet in San Francisco. But I wondered whether any of the, the, the Mary particularly, might respond to what challenges that presents in an operational setting. Did, is, is that something that you, people retooling, is that something that you've had to do in Shell? People, or? people are a problem. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad I asked them. <laughs> uh, Rob's exactly right, it's about skills, and I'd like to throw one back at you. Sure. I will answer the question, but I'll give you opportunity to think about it. Okay. I don't think it's about certification, about these, or not only about certification of people in this team, how are we going to get the IT graduates coming up understanding this before they even enter the work, workplace? I'm, I'm glad you asked, yes. and I will respond. <laughs> but it, it's not only that what Rob said about skills is absolutely correct, and making people work in a different way is hard. People are change resistant. Absolutely. Even the ones that are, you know, most supportive of the cause even have trouble making changes. Absolutely. Because, it, it, you know, it's a great story, Mary, but it's about them, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. I think everybody should change except me. Yeah, right. <laughs> the world would be a better place if everybody else changed. But that, that changed. comes back to, to this, uh, as, you, as you, you said, around automation. Is it, so one of the things we look at a lot of in, in Evelyn Packard is around the journey which is really saying, well, you can start by automating a lot of the individual things, you can orchestrate across, and then you can do transformation. So really creating that industrialization of IT first. Yeah. Because then you have a foundation for the people, and you're taking up all the manual part, which is the ones that would otherwise be very scared about transformation because they would potentially not be the ones you're needing afterwards. But you take that out of the transformation game. Yeah, maybe, and also what Mary, you pointed out is, um, 
if you look at the, uh, the graduates that come from school, mm -hmm. I mean, it's interesting to know how agile works, and that, that, that's typically where they are trained in, right? New capability, which is fun, and, and but IT management in yeah. as basis is not uh, really um, teach very well, or they cover ITIL a bit, but that's too much process oriented. It doesn't really. Nobody that I found coming from a university or whatever, they suddenly are in the IT world, let's say, and they are IT specialists in some way, they have no clue what's happening in an IT organization and what's yeah. needed to run IT. And ITIL doesn't cover that right, no. very well. It, it, it's, it's, it's indeed, as you mentioned, it's a gap. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and I've, I've had the you know, interesting opportunity to hire two interns recently to help with some of our product development. And they're emerging graduates from four-year programs in a, a small school uh, where I live in northwestern Wisconsin. One, a computer science uh, graduate in December, one an MIS graduate. And they'd heard of uh, source control and maybe did a little bit of it on some actual projects. So, you know, again, I've got a very small sample size, but I was surprised that they weren't coming to the table knowing all about, you know, subversion and, and continuous integration and all that kind of stuff, and that I had to prove to them that it worked and that it was a foundation for having more than one person working on stuff at the same time. And similarly, the whole idea of um, uh, tracking defects, uh, work item planning, you know, and, and then the thing that I was, you know, so I may have to go back to these folks, uh, professors and programs, um, but they uh, struggled with doing even simple things like debugging. Yeah. <laughs> but, yeah. But, but you mentioned like requirement to deploy is probably the most, um, well, let's say item where it's taught, like people are in test-driven development, they are yep. typically yep. around development. There's yes. a lot of focus on development and yep. development skills. Yep. Maybe you're not always on the end, but not on the end-to-end. -end. Yep. If you develop something and it needs to run for another few years, or some application even run 20 years, let's say. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The stuff seems to stick around a lot longer than you expected it yeah. to, right? And I guess I've always thought that you know, one of the things we have to be careful about with the, the agile software development movement, particularly some of the zealots on one end of the extreme, is I thought I think it's patently unfair for a small community of people that are involved in the shortest period of an asset's life cycle to be able to set the terms of engagement for the rest of the organization. Yes. You know, and I think that's very myopic, narrow-minded, because again, what about the poor people that have to support and operate it? Now, of course, if you move to a DevOps model, they become one and the same, and they gain a you know a broader viewpoint of what that means. Yeah. So one of the things I encounter is in the agile. Let's say a lot of businesses or IT organization wants to be agile, like they implement Scrum and all those capabilities, and then suddenly they come up with the new idea of uh, we are a team and we can decide how we work because it's decided on the workflow, right? That's yep. one of the agile uh, manifesto, you know, interactions above tools and processes. And as a result, they say, we don't need documentation, we don't need because we are agile. And by itself, that is correct, but they still need to work in an end-to-end -end world where they deliver something that needs to be operated and supported and improved continuously. So it, it is a bit challenging now because they say, let, let you know, tools are not important. It's about we collaborate with the business what they want. So, and, and then we come with IT for IT and say, well, we actually want to standardize that. And that, that's one of the challenges we face. Yeah? I think so. Getting? I think so. And I, I respond very positively to this comment about agility. So the students need to be a lot more agile, too, coming out of university. And I take full responsibility <laughs> as a representative <laughs> ac academic <laughs> in the forum. In fact, it's one of the things that draws me to it. So one of the things that we need to, if you will, evangelize with IT for IT yeah. is the learning opportunity that this presents for improvement of the generation of students. So there are clearly graduate programs. Um, I had a conversation with one of Lars's colleagues over lunch, so we're moving that forward and closing some loops. But high awareness, Mary, and we will get it. But if you think people resist change, you should work in an academic institution. <laughs> <laughs> Another order of Maybe magnitude. we should swap one day and then we can decide which, My goodness. which organization is more change resistant. What, what fun we could have, <laughs> what mayhem we could cause. But it's also interesting, and maybe it's something about maturity in the academic world. If I, if I look at the professors and what have I, I agree. that it goes on, on, on many of the uh, computer science faculties. Yes. They have no clue as to how IT runs, basically, yeah. right? And at the same time, if I go to the manufacturing uh, or the mechanical engineering, if you will, they 
actually have courses in processes and process yeah. design and plant design and yeah. stuff like that. Uh, but if you go to IT, basically these things doesn't exist. Yeah. Um, and, and so it's a very fundamental thing that is missing in, in our education system, I think. And we can repair it to yeah. some degree or by then saying, okay, you start by being a developer or, or, or something, but then we need as an industry to, to create the capability of, of, of further education after you graduate. Yeah. It's almost like you have to develop a sort of IT for IT game where you have teams of students working at the strategy portfolio development and then see what happens when you don't do this very well because then it runs in production and there's an incident. Mm. It's like almost like a game you play and it's not difficult to create in a university kind of a setting or even in a business to let play and see, okay, if we don't collaborate together, it doesn't work, provide the business value as we expect. So can we do so, like so Monopoly, the IT for no, IT no, no. edition? Oh no, it's, it's more sophisticated and Rob's actually presented a kind of a model that could be stood up quite quickly. Mm. You can role play the Phoenix project. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Um, and for a graduate or an MBA type thing. But this is a persistent problem. So true story, 25 years ago when I first came into higher education, um, my, one of my senior colleagues asked whether or not it was necessary to teach programming skills to MBA students, which we did at that time. And my answer was a firm yes, because they need the conceptual underpinnings of what those senior management responsibilities bring with them when you are sent to a role like Mary's in a complex organization like Shell. I think it's irresponsible to let them out, if you will, without that conceptual apparatus, because otherwise they can't make sense of and bring into operation something like the standard that we've launched today, but still. But yes, responsibility acknowledged, and we'll move on. If there are questions from the audience, I'd like to drive the dialogue that way, and if needs be, I'll take us back onto the theme. Would you wait for the microphone to come to you, sir, simply because we're trying to record this so that we can stream <coughs> it later on to the folks not able to attend? Thanks very much. Hi, I'd just like to respond to, your, um, <coughs> to Mary's question, really. Um, we are actually working with several universities in the UK, um, and in response to Rob, we use gamification gamification in that as well so we give them roles responsibilities show them the impact etc etc and uh, my conversation with Chris just outside was to make him aware that the University of the West of England in the UK will be looking at IT for IT to be part of one of their degree programs at next September awesome. impressive awesome and the, the the rather nice piece of loop closing there is is it your chairman graduated with his PhD from the University of the West of England. So Jane Berry, the program director there, will be back in touch with me and hopefully then we can map it across the Atlantic too and take what has been developed there into USF initially and we'll see where we go from there. So a nice nudge. Okay, further questions from the floor. Mr. Ryan. Yes, um, over the last couple of days we've heard uh, a lot of discussion, particularly with the keynotes yesterday from BAE Systems, around the importance of initially developing the case for change and the big why. Okay. As each of you have worked with your CIOs, your leadership teams, how are you articulating the big why for this? Why it's important? Why now? Is it simply the cost savings or is there something more? I'm going to make a great admission here. We don't have the big why and we don't have the full force between for just doing IT for IT. It, there isn't a case for doing that. For each individual step and actually embedding this where it makes sense opportunistically with a business case is the way we're approaching it. But actually everything that you saw on my roadmap is making sense. It's slotting in somewhere into somebody's agenda. And the more we see the emerging technology come in, the more and more you see it. And you can, you can see, since we started this three years ago, we've done license management, we've done cost transparency, we're in the middle of portfolio management, and all of the new cloud management stuff is close on its way, and we're, we are just starting our journey there. So we're, we are in a tidal wave where the tsunami is going to come and hit us if we're not prepared. Yeah. And I think there's, there's almost, if you will, a double negative there. So I prompt you to respond a bit further to Rob's last slide, the one with the <laughs> balloon on it. 
because I think that goes some way to address in Ryan's question. I, I know Rob very well. He, he's often around in show as well. And his last slide really, really caught my attention. If you don't remember it, it had the herd of hippopotamus, was it, and, and the balloon. And the day, there is a greater danger of us not changing way, the way we manage IT and becoming a dinosaur and eventually becoming extinct than actually saying, there's a better way of doing this. Let me show you and let me lead the way. We are, it's far less risky to stick your head over the parapet and say, let's change, because there's greater danger from leaving it behind. I, I tend to also try to ask the opposite question. What's the alternative? So yeah. I'm okay with you not doing IT for IT, but tell me what you're going to do instead. And nobody can come up with an answer, um, except, well, we're going to reinvent the wheel. Uh, okay, fine with you. But, <laughs> but, but the why question was raised at Delta Lloyd, so it was not an easy task to convince people because there was budget needed to, to implement this journey. So what was initially done is said, okay, let's at least look at a sort of IT for IT blueprint and look at how you organize today. And then look at the, all the changes that were coming, like new cloud infrastructure, more and more changes, more vendors, more security risks, and agile and DevOps teams. So suddenly there, there were about 10 different projects identified where people were working on, but there was no glue between them. And they were all already ongoing in some way. That was a DevOps pilot, an agile pilot, monitoring needs to be improved, application portfolio management, business chain monitoring, all those things were there, right? And then the Y said, okay, we need to streamline that. So uh, there was a, a new service management tool needed, and, and it's not about tools, but also they want to reorganize the IT organization with DevOps teams. So they were basically uh, stuck in the old way of thinking, okay, we improve there, improve there, improve there. And then we said, okay, if you need to improve on a roadmap and select the items you do first, yeah. Then people say, well, we need a business case. So we, there was a business case still needed to build, and that's still challenging. And the business case was here built on automation of the new cloud infrastructure. So there was a, that was the advantage, because they want to move the legacy applications to the more cloud platforms. And that was basically not really a greenfield, but that was the enabler to say, if you do that now, you need to do it from the start correctly. And then you got your budget, because you didn't have budget for IT for IT, but you had budget to move to the cloud. And part of that budget to move to the cloud is used for implementing IT for IT. Okay. And a lot of IT organizations are in that mode that they move to the cloud, and that costs a lot of money to invest. And then you say, well, if you move to the cloud, it costs that money millions of investment. You might as well reserve 10% of that migration to IT for IT. Still a lot of selling to do, but that's the, what you see happening a lot. Yeah. The danger of not intervening when you see all of those things going on is they will do exactly what I said in my presentation. Each of those eight initiatives will go out and buy a new tool. And it's the worst thing in the world if you're trying to get to an integrated IT for IT. So you better be on the front foot and you better go out there and catch them early, otherwise you're going to be even further behind. And, you know, and we're seeing in a lot of our clients that IT is, you know, so I think what you were saying, Mary, trying to get ahead of the curve a little bit because they kind of can see what's happening in the increased demands and expectations, short turnaround times, in order to really support the agility of the enterprise. Although we need to be careful about getting caught up in proxy variables about agile. You know, what does that mean as it relates to increasing profitability, reducing cost, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, but, you know, for example, you know, how, how you know, I look at, you know, architecture in, 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 in particular needs to promote and encourage agility. I mean, if, you're, if you do architecture and you're not agile, I think that's an impedance mismatch. I mean, your, your brain should explode because <laughs> that is the whole reason of doing architecture is to respond to change. Um, and, and not being prepared for the velocity of change and the, the multi-sourcing you know, approaches that are coming down the pipe. Um, you know, I think a lot of IT executives are looking for, you know, to get ahead of the curve. And then there's just, you know, very basic simplification opportunities. You know, I'm sure you guys have it really, you have some uh, very uh, dramatic circumstances to, 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 to deal with in the scope of your organization. But like when we've been working at... Uh, a couple of companies in the U.S., you know, one has 13 service request systems. Mm. So when you want to put in a ticket, there's 13 <laughs> systems you might put it in. And there are 13 teams that are supporting that. Some of them are custom applications. They're not 
package implementations, commercial uh, things, and and so there's you know a, a huge opportunity to make you know to 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 get IT to be more lean and mean and optimized, and obviously you know the gist of you know my perspective is trying to take an art enterprise architecture lens towards you know trying to bring those things to a reality. We also see that in a number of cases, and it's very much in line with what you're saying, is that it's a multi supplier situation, yeah. so it might be amplified by cloud, and, and unfortunately some people have a naive belief that okay, if you put it in the cloud, then, then it's all done, but still the management still needs to be there, they're realizing that, and then because of the promise of things being quicker in the cloud, they, they realize, well, if I don't have a more systematic approach of then doing the management side, I'm part of my language, screwed. Uh, and, and maybe we are called in at, at, at the very last end of that and then say, okay, well, I just happen to have this thing, right, and I can bring it out and like, oh, wow, please, when can we have the next meeting, right? And, and it actually becomes a pretty easy sell around using IT for IT. It, it doesn't become a question, yeah, we just need to do it, right? There's nothing else. Okay, so I was going to pose you a question. So I've had some in involvement in this over the years, which has always made me aware of a kind of what, what I've written about as a strategic vacuum. So you've got a very strong vision from the CIO or somebody in Mary's office at the top. You've got really full understanding of what it takes to architect a solution from folks like um, Chris and Rob particularly. Is there something in that middle space that we need to do with operational managers to raise their awareness of the capabilities that the new standard offers. And shall we refer to that layer as permafrost? <laughs> <laughs> There's a whole load of vision that comes out of the top and it goes down one layer with the CIO and we'll go, yeah, this is great. And somewhere low in the organisation, if you tell them about it, they go, thank God, finally they've seen the light. But in the middle... Interesting. They're just resistant to the change they don't see it and actually that is the layer that you've really got to get because that's the layer that's actually going to make the difference yeah and it's communication it's engagement um it's reassuring you said it. some of these people are going to be effective if we're successful in this if we manage it better we potentially don't need as many it people and we have a lovely english expression that says if you can't change the people change the people <laughs> and they can see that second change the people coming so it's yeah. actually we're actually in a, a really kind of difficult but, but, but uh, actually to that point I've, I've seen that it helps a little bit when I meet the permafrost I love that expression uh, later <laughs> uh, I won't uh, address them that way but uh, when when, uh, when I meet with these people if I go out and say well IT for IT is not about uh, organization or process re-engineering it's around figuring out what tools and systems you need to put in place, which is the normative part of it. Yeah. Then they sort of say, okay, I can relax a bit because they're not about uh, optimizing my people or m myself. It's just about solving my problems and I have problems with all the tools not being all right. So then we get in the door, right? Then we can have the discussion. Then maybe at a later stage something else will happen with that layer but then it's too late for them to, to object to it but but going in with that uh, message around it's it's tooling that we're really talking about that helps a little bit in in getting in the door okay which which leads me to another question and observation and forgive me for um stealing the the, the, the energy from the floor to what extent do you think that the certification of tools um, products, services, and so forth will add velocity to that change process. So I think in your presentation, Lars, you said that that will come second after the defrosting of the permafrost layer <laughs> through people certification. I mean, it, it makes... It's much easier to adapt IT for IT once we get to that layer. Obviously, okay. when, when the uh, thinky words of, of adapters, uh, and I, I like yeah. that drawing. I do have a 3D <laughs> printer, by the way, and I, I knew about these kind of things. I am trying to combine Lego with, with uh, Knex, but, um, <laughs> but, but uh, it seems to be harder in IT. Um, and, and so once we have that certification, that is easier than to do it. But it's not the problem we have with IT for IT right now. It's more the recognition that you need to use that method. Yeah, I think it's still the vacuum in between. I mean, it's the tooling maturity and the integration. A lot of effort to configure and tune your applications to manage the end-to-end -end workflow is a lot of work. 
But I think it's indeed the middle layer that IT4T reference architecture doesn't directly, yeah, I mean, apply to. They will read the document and say, oh, that's architectural stuff. Yes. Right? And, it's, and it's not the CIO level either. It's indeed in the middle. They need to have that high-level value chain picture as well. And yeah. they don't need all the details, but they need to adopt that model. Yeah. So we need also a sort of deliverable, not called reference architecture, but something IT for IT business for IT architecture. Oh, not, not architecture, but something that, that applies to them, right? Yeah. Because there are a lot of organizations that like to not use an architectural point of view. They like to be pragmatic, and they see architecture as a sort of, oh, yeah, there's nice big diagrams, complexity. What does it bring value? So we need to have that get, solve that gap at the same time. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so we need to get away from that ad hocery that Mary was talking about, where you'll assign a new role to somebody. <clears throat> so the next question is, is in that layer, are there entirely new roles and skill sets that we need to train to? So this is, this is where you guys will give me the assignment for the development of that curriculum, I think. So you uh, mentioned... One of the roles I see is, let's say, take each value stream as an example. There will be a sort of lead for each value stream. Yeah. So what that person needs to do, he needs to be a, a specialist in kind of way to understand all the practices that you need to strategy to portfolio. Yeah. It's not a techie, it's not an architect, it's a person that understands what do we need for capabilities to run this and continuously improve it. So it's yeah. typically on the IT management side, still IT, but uh, less from the tools, but a, little, a combination of everything, data, process, uh, and and we see the same sort of thing with you know taking a, an EA approach towards running your business, a capability owner, yeah. you know someone who's responsible for that part of the value stream. Yeah. And then, of course, there's got to be a capability architect because by God, we need one yeah. more architect. Yeah. But it's not um. easy to find those. Because it's very <laughs> difficult to find those persons. Yeah, well, exactly. And, and I'm hoping that the, the certification program will be a, you know a step in in the direction of at least informing people what's the language that we use to describe the things that we do and the way we describe the IT landscape. Absolutely. Um, and it, I think it will help remove uh, one layer of, you know, what, it, what, I, what is the value stream? What are the capabilities so that people can focus on how to make them work within their organizations? Because we have, uh, um, I'm, I'm curious if, if the people in the, on the panel and the, uh, in the audience, we have a number of clients that have departments or org, org units within IT called IT for IT. Mm. That has nothing to do with this. Oh. They just thought it was a cool acronym. And it's, you know, hey, we're going to be running, you know, IT like we're trying to run IT. Um, and, and I don't know if the Open Group's going to go chase after those guys for a trademark infringement, <laughs> um, which I don't think is, you know, the idea. But just to help, again, inform people, you know, we've been doing IT stuff for a couple, you know, decades, maybe even over almost a half a century now. Not that there still aren't opportunities for improvement and a broader view, but, you know, those the value stream and the logical uh, components, the data stuff is pretty well understood, and I think this is a, a, a specification that you know makes that much more clear and obvious, yeah. so that we can start having the more value add, you know, discussion, which is what are we going to do, yeah. as opposed to what is it. And that's what it is. These people need to be out there, and they need to stop fiddling with tools. Okay. Yeah. I am an IT for IT department, and I do do this. <laughs> <laughs> and it's my job to make sure that Shell has the proper IT for IT integrated tool set to do its job. What I need that layer to be doing, what you say, what you need to train them on, I need them to understand what outcomes they're trying to do, yeah. and it's their job to improve the performance of Shell, not improve the performance of IT for IT. Well, this exactly. is where I, this is where it's a means I, to an end. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. This is where I think the four presentations were so rich because Rob came out with a new role that I'd never heard before, but realised I'd seen before. So you talked about a service portfolio manager. Now, I think that's a defrosting of part of that permafrost, and I think it's what people like Sue and others that I've worked with over the over the years call relationship managers. Those are the guys that were interfacing between the business units and the internal IT shop, and those are the sorts of skill sets that we need to look at through the people certification in order to enable those transitions of both people and process. So I get it, but. With help, we can take that out into the wider world. But, but okay, I'm, I'm, I'm scanning the floor now because I need to invite questions. We have one from Mark Smalley, I think. Yeah, thank you, thank you. Yeah, I, uh, I raised my hand to ask a question before the uh, the permafrost discussion. <laughs> so, but before before that, I had a very productive discussion with uh, Etienne here, front left from HP. 
Uh, we came up with the, the, the notion of the f uh, role for you, Chris, uh, the role of the IT information manager. Okay. I think there's going to be a need for an IT information manager, so that's something to think about. The question that I had partially addressed in the beginning when you talked about skills yeah. and when resistance was touched on, I'd like to develop it a little bit further by moving it on into attitudes and cultural issues that you've come across, and in particular the kind of interventions that you've found either successful or not successful. Last mentioned one, talk about tools. Right. To divert the, uh, the you know, so any other thoughts it's, it's, on that? So I can, I can just give another angle into that is that very often when we go into the room sort of setting up an, an IT for IT workshop, uh, typically because there is very often an operational issue, so it's in D2C area, it kind of starts, that's where we have most of the engagement that just goes head on. And we get these tribes of people coming in, and it's very clear that they're coming in and really hating each other, not maybe personally, but at least from a fighting for the budget, etc. And so, uh, as we then explain, uh, first of all, as we start with the tooling, we're not talking about their departments, but they realize suddenly what is the value of what the other guys are doing um, that are responsible for some of the other tools. And I'm always I'm tempted to say flabbergasted or at least surprised that they weren't aware of the importance of these other guys. No. Uh, and after these meetings, we see some of these tribal things being broken yeah. down because they suddenly say, well, actually, I do think you should have the budget so that you can do that because that's a reason why I'm not successful because this seem to be or this uh, change process is not working. That's why my network designs are never being implemented correct. And, and so that, to me, explains that uh, problem in, in the industry that people don't actually understand things end to end. And now we have a method of explaining that fairly simple. With all respect to, to, to sort of the classical enterprise architect, it ends up with very complicated diagrams. And so unless you are willing to invest <laughs> uh, a lot of time, you don't really understand that picture. But it, uh, now yeah, I can do it in a single slide. I can get people to really understand end to end. And that helps a lot in breaking down these barriers. Yeah. I I, I agree, yeah. Yeah, one of the things which is also important during the implementation of these kind of programs is, is that you measure and you ask people, it, it's a it's tool, uh, Delta Lodge uses this pulse. It's a kind of measurement. Do the team still believe in this? Because everybody understood the vision and said, yeah, this is what we want. And there was enthusiasm to, to implement this. But once you go to some, you know, some issues and, and you always find some blockers on the way and you measure, do people believe in it? Do they still support this vision and idea? And, and if you measure that with each of the teams, you can anonymously score and see, oh, here we see that they don't believe it. They believe in the tool aspect, but not in the roles or the skills. So you, mm. you need to measure that throughout your project and, yeah. and in the different teams to feel what they're, because they don't tell immediately that they don't believe in it. They only will execute, but they don't really 100% support it, or maybe after a few months. So you need to measure that yeah. and, and have a sense uh, and, and then steer on that. Can I go back to my first comment? You can indeed. People are a problem. <laughs> but there, there's traditional ways of how you do change management. And the biggest problem with people is everybody responds to change differently. Yeah. And everybody responds to a different way of actually influencing them. And so you actually have to find the right influencing style for the occasion and the audience. And there isn't a single answer. There's not a silver bullet. And uh, you know, you can go by and you can read all the traditional stuff. You know, you can try tell, doesn't work very well in corporations these days. So you, you kind of have to get something that that appeals to your audience. So some people go for very rational arguments and you really need to build your business case and all this. Some people are much more emotionally driven, so you can actually say to them, God, doesn't it awful when this happens? And you can do it that way. But you just have to go through all of the traditional ways of doing it. But I really like your, what you described is a traditional lean exercise, looking at the value stream and getting people in a room, mm. drawing up what they do and finding out where all the disconnects are. And suddenly you've got a whole group of people in there that go, oh, I know what the problem is. And then they're all brought into solving the same problem. Wonderful. Yeah. So they begin to see that vacuum. Yeah. They want to pick a picture which they, yeah. they didn't have before. Right? Absolutely. And they see the responsibilities it created. Okay, great question. Thank you, Mark. There's a hand at the back there, if somebody could... Thanks, Martin. 
Thank you very much. If I could uh, just paint a, a silly situation for you, uh, then maybe you could comment on whether you believe that uh, IT for IT will help clear up a silly situation. But um, I work for Cryptzone and we make access solutions which are fairly general purpose things. They get used in all sorts of ways. And we've worked with some quite large corporates. And uh, we can put a solution in that solves a specific problem that was identified on the back of a project. And then we have a platform in there which now can provision access. But when they have another project coming along, somebody has a separate budget and they, on the whole, will go and look at a different access solution. And we get excuses like, I don't want those guys messing around with my system. Or, I've got a budget and I'm going to spend my budget, even though we've got a platform in place that could do it already. And even worse than that, and I know that licensing has been mentioned already, we have situations in the past where I would know, for instance, that maybe 100 licenses in Australia have just been freed off. And I'm a relatively nice person, so I might say to a guy in the UK, you know there's 100 licenses available in Australia. And he says, nah, it's too difficult to get them pulled across. I'll just buy 100 more. And I'm wondering whether what we're talking about today is actually going to solve some of those sort of issues that we see from the vendor point of view. I'd be happy to give the first uh, go on it. <laughs> Obviously, being one of the core inventors of IT for IT, I would say, yes, absolutely, that will help you. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, but not right now. We need more work. Uh, and, and what I'm getting at is some of the things you are describing here is asset management. Mm. Uh, and, and that's actually work stream we're just kicking off uh, tomorrow. Well, it was kicked off uh, three months ago, but we will really start speeding it up uh, now. Uh, but the bigger thing around understanding, so maybe not with access control, but the similar problems are saying, well, in HP we had probably somewhere around 25 different time tracking systems, right? Uh, and, and we've now rationalized that down to three, I think. That's still too, too many, but, uh, but it's much better. Uh, and, and the reason why we could do that is that somebody actually made the inventory. Somebody actually figured out which time tracking system was better than the other one uh, and, and, and how it came about. And then you could do that portfolio rationalization. So that's maybe the T over to, to you <laughs> on, on, on what, what's the result of S to P and, and what you're doing there. That's exactly trying to solve some of those problems. So I, I think it's actually absolutely right, and you say it's a stupid situation. It is, you know, you said stand up, it sounds like a stupid situation. It's the reality in many big corporates. Mm. It is genuine reality, and I, I could take your story even further and say not only are you going to do that and buy another solution, actually you don't ever get the value out of any of those solutions because nobody's actually defined who should have access to what and the access policies are. So actually we go even further, we buy tools and we don't even use them to their to their full extent that they could help us. And you're absolutely right, portfolio management is where that should help us. We will do portfolio management on the IT for IT portfolio, as well as on all the other portfolios, and we'll do exactly that. And Carol will attest, we, we do that all the time on our portfolio. And the more we look beyond our own barriers and we go out and we look in our lines of business, we find more and more of these solutions. And I can tell you, the oil price being low is really helpful in this circumstance. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> and actually, there, there is another angle to it, and that's the uh, plan, build, run being replaced by plan, build, consume, run. Ideally, mm. once the first, or at least when the, th the third version of the access control has been implemented, it's actually going to be put into a service catalog so that the general rule will be if you need, when you're doing something somewhere and you need access control, you go into the catalog and order it from there. Uh, and it has already been approved and it's ready to go. And if you're not consuming the license any longer, it automatically goes back into the license pool and being managed by the, the consumption part. That is very alien to most IT organizations. That's not how they're run today. Um, but if you implement that, you can get much more agility around that. Yeah, but the example of access management, I think, is, is valid for also for monitoring. You have typically the same. As long as it becomes technology facing, people say, oh, I need different monitoring tools, different testing tools, different deployment tools, different access management tools. But it, maybe it comes back to know what you already have, so they see that maybe it's available already somewhere. And the other is who is accountable within the entire organization for access management. Mm. Apparently, that's very difficult to have one. 
or at least a team, because then maybe access on uh, desktop software is def differently managed than uh, for servers or appli business applications. But that what, what is IT5T trying to solve as well? In this case, requirement to fulfill, if there's access managers part of that, then make somebody responsible that oversees this development and can say, well, actually, we don't need another tool. We would like to improve the access management capabilities we already have, integrating it. Because typically, if you have many different access management tools, you still don't have the understanding of what is a user perspective. If a user logs into a portal, what access rights does he have if that is spread around in 10 different access management and request management tools? But, yeah. um, but it comes back to who owns that, that, that capability. Yeah? And, and, and we see a lot of organizations that it's very product-centric. Yeah. So someone owns the Windows database platform, someone owns the DB2 database yeah. platform, or Linux versus this. But as Togaf would talk about, really trying to elevate the value proposition from the solution building block level to the architecture building block level, which is, you know, Togaf's way in some ways of talking about what's the capability, what are yeah. the requirements, and having that single uh, point of entry. And, and like others had talked about, you know, trying to, you know, internalize uh, demand management, portfolio management into uh, the IT world is a, you know, an obvious uh, thing, but very difficult to implement. It's been our experience that when you ask, you know, you know, an app owner in IT, can you add this new requirement to your asset? No one ever says no. Mm. No one ever says, let me check with my buddies who might do the same thing. They immediately take the budget and go with it without that rationalization across the portfolio. Yeah. So of course, the, the answer is enterprise architecture. But, but there, is a <laughs> <laughs> but there, there is another thing that is important, and we're working a lot on that in IT for IT, but it's not super well articulated yet in the release standard, and that's around the shift from products and applications yes, to, to service. services. Yes. And, and thinking about access service as a service, not as a product that is yeah. implemented. And that shift is actually more fundamental than most people will believe. Um, and, and, and so that's, uh, so we have a, a white paper on it and there is some material on it and we want to evolve it more, but, but I hate it when people talk about application portfolio optimization. No, it should be service portfolio optimization. It just happened that some of the services are implemented by applications. And that pulls you two together because <laughs> suddenly you'll have a service owner and right. not multiple application owners. Exactly, yes. exactly. Yeah, and another challenge is if you do IT for IT, that you would like to deliver that to the, as a service to the IT community, yeah, the developers and testers. And, but then you need to have a good service. Like, because there are shared services in any organization, like shared integration service, BizTalk, or we have a shared uh, service for reporting. And typically, people tend to say, well, it's too, not dynamic, it's expensive, we can do it cheaper own way. So, and that's a key thing. You don't need to over-design that central service. It needs to be simple, easy to use, uh, because if you over-engineer it, like a, an integration bus that you use for other purposes, or a reporting service, it probably will fail because it becomes expensive, uh, and people tend to say, well, we're not adopting the standard service, mm -hmm. we're going to do it ourselves because it's yeah. faster. But, but that also leads to the other thing that we're talking about. IT needs to change into becoming a service provider. Yeah. Yeah. It's part yeah. of running IT as a business. So if you cannot put in your service catalog things that the lines of business IT <laughs> yeah. will consume, that's because you're not doing an appropriate job. The reason why they go to Amazon is because your own private cloud is not good enough, uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, and, and so suddenly you have a different kind of measurement not whether you deliver on budget on time, but actually whether you deliver on satisfaction and, and whether you get uh, consumers in the lines of business. That's a major shift for a lot of IT organizations. Indeed. So I think you've heard a, a multi-dimensional yes in response <laughs> to that. So we have just a few more minutes, folks. So we have time for one more question, which I see Martin is ready to uh, share with us. And then I'll just pull the panel to a close. Yeah, so uh, in the new world of uh, you know digital business and IoT, how will you position IT for IT? So in the new world of the Internet of Things and digital, big okay, data. and big data, how will we position IT for IT? Yeah, gosh, I see. Simple, even more important. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, you, 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 you can, uh, well, big data and, and IoT is two different things. Uh, to, 
well, they're interlinked and we can go out drawing wind diagrams around the intersections. But uh, Internet of Things, for instance, is also around the, uh, the technology for production plants, etc., that, that goes in, in in large IT. And, and, and this convergence of everything technology-wise into uh, to something that has to do with IT just implies that IT has more roles to play. And so it becomes more important that we have a streamlined way of managing and optimizing and delivering those kind of capabilities. Yeah. But there will be, with IoT, just like there was with any other evolution of, of, of IT, a degree of chaos to begin with, where mm -hmm. there are shadow IT and people doing uh, special projects and not being under the umbrella of, of the IT budgets, uh, and, and eventually it will be brought back in and, and be controlled. Uh, that's the nature of innovation, I guess. Yeah, for me, uh, it, it, like big data or cloud or mobile or Internet of Things, there are new technologies that a business would like to have potentially mm -hmm. even, asking for it. But it 5 t then includes the dimension, how are we going to manage that to make it a success? So big data is often sold as a technology by big data vendors. <laughs> and then it 5 t needs to think about how are we going to manage it to make it really a value for the business and implement this, not just that it's running there, but does it bring the value as the requirements big business would like to have it? So it brings the dimension more about how do we manage big data as a solution to the business and make it a success. Mm. And, and basically relevant for any other technology or new technology. Think about management as well. Yeah. Uh, and we've been seeing organizations wanting to think of data as a service, mm -hmm. analytics as a service, so just one more thing mm -hmm. to put it into the service portfolio. That there is one thing coming up, that security in those two areas that, that uh, is, is more important than ever, right? And you could say what we currently have in terms of security or governance, risk and compliance, if you will, that's sort of intersect with security, uh, is not very well articulated yet in IT for IT. So there is more work to be done there. And so, so just taking IT for IT and say it solves all your problems, no, that's not true, at least not version two. Uh, version nine, maybe, ish. Yeah. <laughs> so it's been a memorable day. We've, we've launched the standard. Um, it is concrete, but it needs help to grow and evolve and respond to all these challenges. Um, please join me in thanking our four panelists for a wonderful discussion. Pleasure.